So hi everyone, um, it's a great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Patrick Short, the CEO and co-founder of the company Sanogenetics, to give us this lunchtime talk with the Oxford Centre for Personalised Medicine. So Patrick graduated with a double major in quantitative biology and applied mathematics from the University of North Carolina before pursuing a, P a Wellcome Trust PhD in mathematical genomics and medicine at the University of Cambridge and the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute where he focused on discovering non-coding mutations implicated in developmental disorders. Since then, Patrick has co-founded and is the CEO of Sanogenetics, which is a patient finding and engagement service, which aims to enable researchers to deliver personalized medicine more quickly and at lower cost. So Patrick was also one of the first interviewees in our CPM flash yeah. interview series, where we discussed his own journey, um, the role of industry in personalised medicine and his hopes for the future in the field. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Patrick with his talk entitled Accelerating Precision Medicine Research with Digital and At-Home Testing. And we'll be taking questions at the end, so please pop anything that you want to ask in the chat. Over okay. to you, Patrick. Thank you so much and thanks for the great introduction. Thank you all for being here today. I'm hoping that uh, this will be an interactive discussion and uh, I'm not gonna probably talk for the entire hour, so uh, we should have plenty of time for questions and um, and discussion at the end. So yeah, thanks again for the great introduction for the opportunity. I am gonna focus a little bit today on a really like a framework or a different way of thinking about how to accelerate precision medicine research. And part of the backdrop of this is, as Catherine mentioned, I did my PhD in genomics and worked in particular on a couple of very large-scale genetic testing programs, um, some of the precursors to the 100,000 Genomes Project and the 100,000 Genomes Projects itself. And one of the things that I noticed in my research career was how difficult it was to actually recontact patients for recontact by genotype studies and, and clinical trials. And part of this is um, historical. I think when we started doing large-scale genomic studies, we didn't really fully understand what the impact of being able to recontact participants based on their genotype in the long run might be. And I think also part of it is technological, um, not having the tools to actually do recontact and engagement easily at scale with, with the limited budgets that we have. And I think part of it is also potentially cultural, like how do we get around the questions and the ideas of recontacting uh, based on something that might be just a genetic risk factor and not a, um, a clean cut, diagnostic when we start to talk about polygenic risk scores or even a not fully penetrant genetic variants. So that was my um, kind of introduction to the problem. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about what I see uh, as, as the catch-22 that we're facing as an industry. As Catherine mentioned, my background is in uh, large-scale exome and whole genome sequencing, really focused on rare disease uh, gene discovery. I worked in Matt Hurl's group at the Sanger Institute on a, a groundbreaking project called DDD that is still running today that's done a, I know a number of people in the audience have been uh, associated with it in some way. So I did my work on non-coding variation there. Um, I actually have a sort of personal connection to the field as well. So my family has uh, more than half of the members on my dad's side of the family have uh, kidney transplants and we have some kind of rare kidney disease in the family that actually was very recently, I'm talking like a couple of weeks ago, uh, the researchers that we've been working with believe they've discovered the gene and I found out that I was a pre-symptomatic uh, gene carrier. So um, I have always seen this from the other side of the perspective because we've been in research studies donating blood, saliva, urine, and so on. Um, and often actually hearing nothing back uh, for, for years, or in some cases, never hearing anything back. And so I always felt from the participant side that there was a big opportunity as well to, to do better than what we do today, and, and frankly, solve some of the research problems that we have around recontact and long-term engagement and research. So uh, I started this company in 2018, uh, shortly after I finished my PhD. And I'm not going to talk too much about what we do. I'm going to show some examples of some of the programs that we run, but I'm more going to focus on the the framework and the and the maybe different way of thinking about running long-term genetic studies that I think could be applied in any context. Um, so I'm going to talk about, not, not for a whole hour, but I'm going to talk about what I see as a catch-22 in precision medicine development and maybe a different way of thinking about the problem. Uh, second, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of our approach to it and then uh, just quickly summarize at the end. 
So what, what do I mean when I say catch 22? We have um, a lot of activity in genetically targeted medicines. So in rare diseases, uh, every couple of weeks, we see a great announcement about a new transformative therapy for genetic subsets of patients, but also now increasingly in common disease. There are clinical trials going after targets like LARC2 in Parkinson's, GBA in Parkinson's, APOE4 and Alzheimer's. So I think we all probably agree that at some point in the future, we're going to live in a world where instead of treating Alzheimer's, we're actually going to treat genetic subtypes. And instead of treating a disease like um, ulcerative colitis or MS, we might actually treat patients de de defined by a particular set of biomarkers and genetics being an important one of those. But we have a problem, which is that the healthcare system, generally speaking, won't pay for genetic testing until there's a really clear clinical benefit. And, and this makes sense in some ways, because um, if there's no reason to genetically test a patient with Parkinson's, for example, because it's not going to change their care, then potentially rightly the budget strapped the healthcare systems or insurance providers may say, we're not going to pay for that at the moment. But the catch 22 is until we've tested patients, it limits the discovery we can do of how existing medicines might affect patients differently. And it also affects things like trial recruitment, because patients don't know their genetic status or their doctor doesn't know, then they won't know they're eligible for a trial. Um, one of the potential solutions to this is large scale research programs like biobanks and population genomics programs. But I, I think we, those of us who work in the industry have probably experienced how challenging it is to actually recontact out of these programs. Sometimes it's due to the consent at the outset of the study. And in other times it's, it's more infrastructure uh, and technology related of it. It is just difficult. We have to um, resort to old clunky systems that make it difficult to segment people and contact them more easily. So um, to dive into the first part of this a little bit, why doesn't genetic testing happen? This is a really nice paper. It's based in the US. Uh, I believe that a lot of these apply, although not all of them here in the UK, um, is why a healthcare provider wouldn't order genetic testing for their patients. So it's things like insurance, um, not knowing which tests the patient may not want a genetic test because there's you know, fear of what might um, what might be found, fear of impact on insurance, um, lack of understanding of what the benefit might be. And then a big one here, genetic test results wouldn't change approach to therapy. Um, and there's concerns about how to talk about testing with, with family members. So a lot of these are, there's, what I want you to get out of this, there's no single response that, um, that, that covers everything. So this really is a multitude of responses. But I think the good news is we can uh, tackle a lot of these with both technology and with uh, changes to our, our ways of working and, and cultural changes. Um, and to take a different disease example and look at the problem from a slightly different perspective, the access to genetic testing is also really highly variable. So we're doing some work at the moment in ALS, which is a rare disease that has about 15% of um, patients that have a, a effectively a monogenic form of the disease uh, where having the genetic variant is highly uh, predictive of, of ultimately getting the disease. And there's a lot of interesting work into how um, genetic variants affect the, um, the severity of onset and the speed of progression. But across these three countries that, that we've profiled here, US, uh, UK, and Canada, access to genetic testing is really, really very uh, different depending on your postcode and depending on the kind of insurance that you have in, in particular in a place like the US. So um, there seems to be a movement to broader acceptance of testing all patients who have a diagnosis of ALS, although even in the, in the UK, it really varies dramatically based on the uh, ALS testing center. Um, but then there's a, a follow on question where there's really not um, a lot of consensus of what approach we take to testing at risk family members. So if you have a parent, for example, who um, is diagnosed with a, with a rapidly progressing form of ALS, um, under what circumstances should all the rest of the family members get tested, uh, in particular in the case where uh, there may not be treatment options available. And of course, this question and paradigm applies to other common diseases like Alzheimer's and ApoE4, where we consistently wrestle with the question of under what circumstances should we return this kind of information to, um, to, to patients and to family members. Uh, so the way that we've thought about trying to solve this problem is if you look at the, the graph on the screen here, typically when we think about the life that a new treatment takes to getting to patients, um, there are some very broad buckets here, early basic research, R&D, 
observational studies like natural history studies to understand how is a ApoE4 Alzheimer's patient different from a non-ApoE4 Alzheimer's, or how is a LARC2 Parkinson's different from uh, other Parkinson's patients, defining the endpoints, understanding what trial design might look like, and then moving into clinical trials to to test for safety, efficacy, and then eventually getting the new, new treatment to patients. We tend to approach these as very discrete blocks, um, and each of these have a really different set of problem statements. So when you're running a global phase three clinical trial, um, you have the problem that I mentioned earlier, which is you need to find hundreds of patients with a rare genetic variant. Um, but if testing isn't wide isn't widespread and you're struggling to recontact people out of biobanks, then you have a really um, you know, major challenge to get a large number of patients tested in a really short period of time to enroll that trial. On the other end of the spectrum in R&D, um, we know that we need linked large-scale genomic and clinical data sets so that we can do that early discovery to start to move medicines into the, uh, the drug development pipeline. Um, and then once the drug is actually approved, we can't take for granted that patients who benefit will actually get the drug. Uh, genetic testing needs to be widespread in the healthcare system to ensure that people get access to the drug. And this can take a lot of time and there can be reasons why this doesn't happen as quickly as we might like. Um, and I think the, the reframe of the problem maybe that I'd like you to consider is rather than thinking about this in discrete buckets, if we redesign the process from the perspective of the participants that take part in each of these phases of research um, and think about the, the challenges that they have. So rather than five different buckets or five different groups uh, working on this, what if we thought about this as a, as a flow through time and a continuous process where a participant might uh, take part in an R&D study here and then could have the opportunity down the line to take part in a clinical trial through some kind of seamless um, approach. And so to think about the problem from the participant's perspective, uh, time, time is really, and speed is really an issue. If you have a progressive form of a disease, then it's really not acceptable to have a 10-year time horizon or 20-year time horizon on a new treatment. Um, so we've got to do what we can for participants to accelerate that timeline. And we've seen that it's possible in the last couple of years with, with vaccine development. It doesn't mean it could be applied to necessarily every disease, but I think there are a lot of aspects of what we do that we could um, move a lot more quickly. In particular, I think there are some low-hanging fruits in recruitment in the clinical trial space if we take advantage of some of the testing that's already been done at a really large scale at this part of the process. Um, and then at the beginning of the timeline here, uh, we know that participants want to help and there's a real drive for fundamental altruism programs like the UK Biobank and the NHR Bioresource and many others have enrolled participants at a very large scale, uh, driven primarily on the, um, the human desire to make things better for others. But I don't think we can rely on this to get to the next scale of uh, recruitment that we need to do in programs that are going to be million plus uh, individuals, we need to think beyond altruism, what can we give back to participants? And one thing is is really clear, actionable research opportunities. And another thing is um, return of results and other useful info that, if done responsibly, can provide a really clear feedback loop that taking part in research isn't just to help others, but it also helps, uh, helps you and helps your family potentially directly. Um, so when we started in 2018, we saw really two things, both of which uh, I think need to be done to solve this problem, this catch-22 that we're talking about of testing not being uh, widely available enough and us not making the most use of the data that we have today. So the first is, how can we make it easier for people who've already been tested by a large-scale population genomics program to take part in new research opportunities? So uh, programs like the UK Biobank and IHR, even mid-sized hospital-associated biobanks um, have done a huge amount of sequencing in the last decade. Um, and how can we make that make it easier for participants who've already donated a sample to one of these programs to opt in to get new research opportunities? Um, and the second is how do we make it easier for people who've never been genetically tested to, to get genetic testing, whether that's in a research context or um, in, in clinical care. And we don't, you know, we don't think we can solve each of these problems ourselves. Uh, I think this is what I see as the superset of the of the high level problems in the industry. And there's a ton of different problems beneath this and other ways to tackle it. But I'm going to focus on these two right now and uh, the way that I think this framework can help us to think about it. So with this, if I just zoom back here for a second, with this view in mind of having a continuous relationship with 
between researchers and participants throughout the whole process. Um, a couple of years ago, we worked with Genomics England to try to co-develop a solution for what participant engagement could look like on a large scale uh, population genomics program. And we've we've written a couple of publicly available reports. So there's one on the PhD Foundation's website that you can see on the right. Uh, and this was a series of both in-person and online uh, real world and virtual whiteboarding sessions where we really focused on from the participants perspective first, what are the um, what are the acorns? Uh, if you can see this little image here, what are the small things that if we did those would make a big difference? And then what are the oak trees, so to speak, the things that may be a little bit harder to achieve, but if we were to do them, um, it would make a big difference to participants. And themes that came out were things like rapid feedback of the impact that participants were having on research. So the personal story I shared earlier of submitting a sample and never hearing anything back, there's a really simple um, feedback loop that we can implement in our research that gives participants lay summaries of the research that they've contributed to, for example. And this was something that came out loud and clear, uh, something that participants felt researchers didn't do enough that they wanted to see and, and that we know technologically is very straightforward to do. Um, there's other more complex things maybe that uh, are still possible though, like return of results, uh, both medically, potentially medically actionable and also things like trait reports that help people to see the value from the uh, sample that they've submitted to a to a research program. Um, so a lot of this info is online. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but what we arrived at over the last couple of years building on this patient centric uh, approach to conducting genetics research is five different modules that we're focused on um, and delivering all of these through a totally at home and online uh, process. So when you're running a new research study, you can do recruitment, e-consent, pre-screening, testing, medical record integration, and, and long-term engagement, all um, in a hybrid and decentralized fashion. And why I think this is really important is, is one, um, the world has changed and it's uh, people are much more used to living in and working from home and are starting to expect that out of research. I think we've, we're playing catch up with the rest of the uh, major, major world industries as well. We can get things like our groceries and our um, and our uh, food delivered at home, but medical research is still very much a, um, something that we do primarily in the setting of a hospital, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, so it's about thinking about how can we make it easier for participants to take part while still keeping the standards of the science high. And we've applied this now to about 20 different research programs. And to just give you an example of some of them before I walk through uh, one example in, in some detail, uh, we've applied this in ulcerative colitis, where more than 95% of patients don't get any genetic testing, but there's a lot of uh, really interesting work going on at looking at how patients respond or don't respond to therapies based on their genetics and also rate of progression. So uh, this is running in the U.S. right now um, and focusing on both at-home genetic testing as well as linking uh, very, very complete long-term medical records. Uh, we've applied this in some uh, more challenging um, uh, populations like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. Again, in, in this case, this may surprise you, but 90% of patients uh, with Parkinson's disease don't get tested, even though there's half a dozen clinical trials in LARC2 and GBA that are actively recruiting. And, and this is for that reason that I mentioned earlier, that patients um, and healthcare providers aren't necessarily aware that they're, that these trials exist and they're not aware that having genetic testing may actually influence treatment either now or in, in the near future. Um, and I'm going to walk you through another example here in a little bit more detail, which is how we think about delivering a participant experience in one of these programs. So uh, I'm going to come back to this screen a few times, and there's a few different buckets here. But at the start of any new or ongoing research project, we need to think about how we reach uh, potential participants, uh, what their uh, you know, what they see when they first come to the program, what is it all about, what's in it for me, what are the risks, um, having things like electronic consent and also the opportunity to speak to somebody if they'd like to learn more. Um, and then beyond this point where we've really been spending a lot of time is how do we deliver a really personalized experience to participants throughout their, um, throughout their time in the program. So, um, in terms of outreach, we partner with a really wide range of organizations. We've always felt that we need to take an omni-channel approach to recruitment. It's not enough these days to just 
do social media or to just set up in a clinic and uh, and wait for people because uh, you're likely to end up with a population that's not particularly representative of the whole group of patients we're looking to treat. So we partner with a wide range of groups to basically spread the word about new research opportunities. Um, and then they come to a study page that allows them to understand more about the research. Who's it for? Uh, what are the potential benefits? Uh, what if I if I'd like to join? Uh, how do I do so? And so on. Um, and then from there, we'll move through a, a onboarding flow. This is all you know, obviously online, and we'll get to some at home stuff in a moment where participants create an account that allows them to come back to the data that they've entered and also request to uh, withdraw uh, to get copies of their own data and also to access things like reports that have been generated. So we've spent a lot of time trying to actually give participants a hub uh, for taking part in research rather than um, that most research today is really uh, you, you show up, you participate, and then there's nowhere really to understand how's the research progressing and what's going on. So we call this a participant portal or, or um, a few other terms in the industry, but uh, we've built in customizable consent forms and totally customizable survey functionality so that you can determine if a participant is potentially eligible and also gather the, the right information needed to determine whether the, the study is likely to be a fit for them. So I'm not gonna go through this in, in a ton of detail. Um, and then we send them an at-home genetic testing kit if they haven't been tested previously by one of the programs that we work with. And, and this is a research grade test. Um, we usually do exome sequencing, although in some cases we'll do whole genome sequencing or arrays. Um, and then moving into the, the personalized feed aspect of this, depending on what a participant um, responds to the joining flow and to any genetic testing, we can deliver a much more, a much richer experience than um, just a one size fits all. Here's a website that, that tells you what's happening. Um, so when somebody completes their, their um, onboarding, they have a personal space that allows them to uh, read interesting articles that may be useful or educational to them and also track things like where is my sample. Um, it's arrived at the lab, it's processing. Some of our feedback from participants really early on was very simple information like this, that, hey, we've received your sample and, um, and we're doing something with it, goes a really long way because if you submit the sample and then never hear anything back, sometimes you wonder, is, it, is anything even happening? And from the research side, obviously I know that lots is happening. It just takes us a long time. Uh, science doesn't happen in, in weeks, it happens in months or years. Um, I'm not gonna go through too much detail here, but I just wanted to show some of the automated uh, steps of keeping re keeping participants in the loop. This has been a big focus for us. How do we um, help participants to really understand um, what you know what what's happening with their sample and with the contribution that they've made? The analogy we often use is if you're waiting at an airport and they've told you that your flight's delayed, um, but they don't tell you when it's uh, when it's going to be rescheduled for. That's a lot more frustrating experience than saying uh, it's been delayed and it's rescheduled for tomorrow at 8 a.m. People really value uh, clarity and, and transparency and uncertainty. Uh, it can be a real challenge. So it, we'd rather say, uh, we, you know, we told you we thought that the, the first research paper would be out in January, but it's actually gonna be out in July because things are taking a little longer rather than uh, just not saying anything at all to participants about what's, what's happening with their uh, data. So you can see on the left here is, is an example with a, uh, a participant in this, uh, program that has the uh, the genetic variant and um, and is going to have the opportunity to speak to a genetic counselor about that result. Or we'll, we'll prompt them and suggest that, that that's something they should do. We're on the right here. If there wasn't a genetic finding, genetic counseling may not be necessary, but may still be something that participant opts to do. Um, and a couple other examples here, but you can really customize the experience to participants and um, and this allows you to build a much better long-term relationship. So when you go back uh, in a year's time to ask the follow-up questionnaire, um, participants really know about the program and know what you are, and it hasn't kind of come out of nowhere of something that they submitted a sample to a year ago and, and never heard anything back. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just going to skip towards the end here because I think you probably uh, understand the gist of, of how this kind of program works, but. You can think of it like a, we call it a participant portal or a digital front door to research 
uh, studies. And, and I, I, my, my feeling is that every research study should have uh, some kind of participant facing experience that allows them at the very minimum to understand what's happening. And this can be something that's as simple as a website and uh, you know, public engagement kind of group that's making sure participants are involved from start to finish. And for larger programs, it can be a, a very sophisticated tool like this that allows you to take um, both engagement and long-term questionnaires and, and real-world data in a, in a slightly more sophisticated way. So zooming out a little bit, the way, the way that we run these programs is to look across all the different ranges of where, where might patients have already been tested. Uh, and so we can reuse that data and we don't need to uh, test people again. So to the point I made earlier, if we've already done large-scale testing through population genomics programs, we've heard really clear from patients and participants that are under the right circumstances, they want that data to be used to help them um, to find a new trial opportunity uh, or to contribute to a new research opportunity. The, the recontact has to be done responsibly, and we can definitely talk um, about some of the approaches we've seen work in that arena. Um, but let's start with where patients have already been tested. And if, if they need to be tested as part of the program, then that's great. And then ultimately patients can be matched with the right research opportunities for them, whether it's um, something as simple as a questionnaire and a research database that helps um, you know, university researchers to do uh, really blue skies, novel basic research, or whether it's slightly more um, focused clinical trials that are testing a really specific hypothesis about safety or efficacy of a medicine. Um, so just to wrap up here, a uh, quick summary. My, my sense is that this approach can be applied to almost any large-scale precision medicine program. Really, the, um, the core of this is how can we design a process that puts patients as, a, as the continuous through line to the whole research process rather than just um, firing up a recruitment team when it's time to run the clinical trial or collecting a bunch of samples here, but never really... Uh, telling anybody the results until five years down the line when we've um, you know when we've had a breakthrough. So this can be applied, I think, to any uh, to any program really. Uh, I think we should focus on how we break down silos between basic research and translation a lot more efficiently. So I've said this a couple of times, but how can we make sure that when we're doing large scale population testing, patients have the opportunity to hear about new uh, research that could be directly beneficial to them, like a clinical trial. Um, starting early has, has, has also been a really, uh, I think, powerful thing, especially when it comes to trials. One of the things that we find is there's a lot of assumptions baked into what, what patients are going to present like, where they're going to be found. Um, those, those of you all who work in clinical trials, you know the inclusion exclusion criteria are uh, extremely specific. And if the assumptions of how common that population of patients is, is off, then you can be in for a really bad surprise when you start the trial and you find that you're excluding almost everybody for something that the literature told you was common, but actually in the real world, it's not. So by starting to engage with patients and do testing programs and work in real world biobanks early, um, you can de-risk those trials a lot and not, um, it, not design a trial that doesn't actually fit the, the people in the world we live in. Um, and then finally, uh, starting early with patients and participants has also been incredibly invaluable to us. So I, I think for anyone in the room who's starting a new program or has an existing one, uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to have a regular uh, participant advisory board meetings and, and work through the participants that uh, are going to be involved in your study into how do you envision it? What are the benefits you envision? Are there ones that um, you're maybe not thinking about that you should be focused on? Are there designs of the program that are creating barriers that maybe you, you hadn't thought about. So as, as one example here, we've been running a number of studies in long COVID. And one of the things that came out really clearly from some of our early participant engagement was that having access to transport to get to a clinical site um, was gonna be a really important thing. Participants were generally uh, not comfortable with, you know, with the fatigue and brain fog they were experiencing to have to travel partway across the city or the country to go attend an in-person visit and not be sure that they were going to have the energy to get um, you know, to get back home. So there's simple things we can do, like like a partnership with uh, ride-sharing companies that allow that to be taken off the participants' plate, and their visit to and from the site can be booked in with Uber or or Lyft or one of the other programs. That means they just don't have to worry about that, and it removes that 
particular barrier from taking part. So I'd encourage you, no matter what, um, to, to make it a part of your workflow. I will stop there and it looks like we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. I see there's a few uh, coming through in the chat. So thanks everyone for your time and um, looking forward to the discussion. Great, um, thanks so much, Patrick. So a couple of questions in the chat. I'm just gonna kick off one from my end first to give people more time um, to put some questions in the chat. So um, you say that you partner with various groups to increase um, the reach and the diversity of participants. Do you have any insight into what the most valuable things are in reaching those underrepresented groups? Yeah, thank you for the question. We, I think we found the thing that has worked the best in our context is to partner with groups that are really deeply embedded in the community. So there a large number of grassroots organizations rather than a small number of national scale organizations or anything like that. We've found that um, groups that are very embedded in communities, whether they're medical research or groups like um, like churches, mosques, so on, that are um, a trusted source within the community can be a great bridge to help to explain what the research is about, why it might be beneficial, or and, and what the risks are. So that for us, like starting small rather than saying, oh, we're going to run a, a radio campaign in a different language actually partnering really closely with the groups and the, and the early engagement that i mentioned as well has been really important because um, you can't have the same messaging with every um with every population so with some um with some populations genetic testing is really a, a great thing and it's interesting and people are um fascinated by the concept with other populations it's something that people are wary of so you have to you know, saying, uh, get, come get a free genetic test is not going to resonate the same with every population. So you really have to actually run it by and involve uh, the groups you're, you're planning to try to enroll in your study as early as possible. So you catch that before you go out with a, with a big campaign that doesn't work. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question in the chat here. So how do you get patients data out of population studies they've previously participated in? My assumption with things like the 100,000 Genomes Project, the participants didn't get their gene sequence back. Yeah, this is a really great question. Some, um, there's, uh, we've seen a couple different flavors of population genomics programs and how they approach recontact. In some cases, uh, there was, there were consent forms that were written 10 years ago that just didn't contemplate it and make it really difficult. So in some cases, consent forms literally said, we won't recontact you directly out of out of any uh, based on your genetic information. That's really hard uh, because you can't, you know, you, it's very hard to break that contract that that you've made with the participant. Um, not not any biobanks that we've worked with, but there are some around the world who've taken the approach that uh, it actually is an ethical obligation to recontact patients in a small subset of cases where the genetic findings are highly medically actionable. I'm, I'm not going to, unless somebody really wants to go there, I'm happy to have the conversation on that. That's the trickiest area is, is if the consent was quite clear that recontact won't happen. Um, there are a lot of groups in the middle where recontact is possible, um, but it's just not something that they've operationalized or that is is something they do um, frequently, or there may be some you know cultural reason why it hasn't happened. It, it, often it's a risk risk averse a risk risk aversion where um there's a lot of risks to recontacting participants and and in many cases it's simply easier to to not so in that case you know it's important to have a really good reason to do so and i think the place we've seen the highest success rate is is in something like a clinical trial where if there's a really clear benefit to participants um and participants have consented that they like to be recontacted then you can work through that use case um and and understand that it's kind of a win for everybody. And then there's a third group, which many modern population, you know, the, the ones getting started in the last couple of years, uh, I've seen take a much more proactive approach on this, where many of them are building in participant recontact from the outset. So all of us in the US, our future health here in the UK are two examples where recontact is, um, is a really core pillar of what they're doing. So I think going forward, we're gonna see most, um, our DNA is another big one in, in Australia. Um, that's kicking off where I, I think we're going to see in the future that most population genomics programs build this in from the outset because there are, if it's done responsibly, there's really good scientific and um, uh, and you know, doing right by the participants, there's good reasons to do so. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, so another one we've got here. So with respect to reconsenting, what would you recommend to address the ethical issues in contacting participants who may not be prepared to receive information outside of the scope of the initial study? Yeah, this is another tricky one. We've approached this a couple times in the past, and the the approach that I like is is to be really transparent and to essentially reopt people into receiving the information. So suppose that um, if uh, I'm just looking in the chat to take the exact example, um, let's say you the the scientists involved would like to recontact participants with a with a particular genetic variant to do a recontact by genotype, but that's a medically you know, potentially medically relevant variant like ApoE4 or something. The last thing you want to do is email people and say, hey, we discovered in our database that you have this and we'd, we'd really like to take your sample and study you. But uh, you know, on the flip side, I think there is a responsible way to do it. The way we've seen it done pretty well in the past is first you email a or contact or call or otherwise a broad group of people that includes both carriers and non-carriers uh, so that receiving the email or the call doesn't imply you have the genetic variant. Um, and then at that point, you're asking whether the person would like to opt into learning about the result. So you're not saying you have it or you don't have it. You're saying, hey, we're running a research study that's focused on this particular genotype. Um, this Getting this message doesn't mean you have it uh, or that you don't have it. We're contacting a broad range of people. If you'd like to uh, you know, hear the implications, if you'd like to learn, then here are the next steps. And so I think that's a pretty responsible way of doing it. And you also have to you have to build the decision tree out and make sure there's support along the way. So have have patients got uh, access to counseling if they need it? Is there um, you know is, is there signposting to other resources? So it's uh, you know it, I think the first the first few times you have to be really um, very methodical about it until you you start to build some pattern matching in your particular organization of okay this is this falls in this category where it's a recontact on a non-medically actionable gene, which may be a slightly simpler pathway than something that's recontact on um, a gene that's, you know, that has potential clinical implications. So the next question I've got here is then, how does the commercial side of the project work? For example, who pays for the sequencing and the communication of the results? And how do you collaborate with other partners such as those in clinical development? Yeah, thanks for the question. We so we charge for our software to coordinate the whole process, the participant engagement, questionnaires, consent. Um, typically, the sequencing is paid for by the researchers running the research program. So in a in a population biobank, for example, um, the researchers pay pay for the testing, and we help to coordinate and provide the participant experience. Um, the uh, was there a second part of that question? I'm just diving back in. Um, how do we collaborate with other partners? Yeah, so the one of the things I'm particularly really interested in is how we can bring the worlds of population genomics and um, clinical development closer together because we work with both groups and we hear from the, um, the clinical development people that they really wish it was easier to recontact out of some of these major biobanks. Um, and we hear from the biobanks that they, you know, they like to do recontact, but they have, there's all sorts of reasons that we're discussing today that make it challenging. So in my mind, there's a really, I, I, I think we're getting there. It's just taking a lot of time, but as an industry, I'd love to live in a world where when, when basic research is happening at an incredible scale powered by UK Biobank and, and other major programs, I'd love to get in a world where those kind of programs can also uh, translate well into the clinical trials space so that participants who are tested in a population genomics program or a newborn screening program can be really easily uh, notified and their doctors notified about a clinical trial opportunity because many times patients just don't know about the opportunity so there's a you know, there's a, a match that needs to be made and and all the info and the I think the willingness is there it's a matter of um, some changing of, of I think cultural norms of how we conduct these studies but it's also a a technology challenge as well of how we make it as easy as possible to do. Um, so the final question that we've got at the moment, um, have you explored offering or selling this infrastructure to people running RCTs? For example, the very large panoramic RCT was a trial for antiviral treatments for COVID-19 in the community. People recruited into the trial participated from home 
and looks like your portal, et cetera, could lend itself very well to this type of study design. Yes, thank you. We do we do some uh, RCTs. We don't currently um, contribute data directly into the trial. And the reason for that is there's a level of regulatory um, compliance that's required to actually contribute data into the trial lock data lock. But what we do is we we run you know, in that graph that I showed where the participants are have a continuous stream. We run that participant engagement stream um, so that clinical trial data itself is still often collected by um, clinical trial sites um, or, or some of the decentralized trial companies that that you probably know of where we provide that engagement layer that gives participants a, a place to go before and after the trial as well because um, also in in many cases in most trials 10 you know n- nine people are screened out for every one that screens in uh, depending on how far back you go in the recruitment funnel it can be even more than that so we also see it as an opportunity to give those participants who screen out an opportunity to take part in a different trial in the future because it's also not a great experience to screen out of a trial and just be told sorry this one's not a fit for you um best of luck so we want to provide a safety net to say okay you screened out of this one it's not a fit but actually all that information you provided you you don't need to provide it again in uh, two months and we can match that information against other available trials and and try to make a match sooner rather than later brilliant um so taking a little bit of a step back then for those in the audience thinking about their next steps how did you find transitioning from being a like student in academia to suddenly setting up a company and kind of being on the industry side? What support could you or did you access for the transition? Yeah, thank you for the question. I had, the, so I was one of those people that loved and still love uh, research. I was not one of those um, PhD students or postdocs that decided actually research wasn't for me and I needed to do something else. So in, in many ways, it was actually challenging decision because I could I could have seen a path for myself continuing to do genomics research for a long time. And um, I have, I think, been lucky to always be in research groups where the PIs were um, embraced an entrepreneurial spirit. So Matt uh, Hurls, when I was at the Sanger Institute, started a company called Congenica. Um, and when I was at the University of North Carolina, I worked in the lab of a, of a professor named Joe DeSimone, who was a start a lot of 3D printing and nanoparticle companies. So I always saw that uh, those these two worlds as being close to one another. And it wasn't like you had to choose between uh, you either do science or you go into industry there. Uh, I always saw people who were doing both and doing them really well. And I felt like the, um, yeah, the, the being able to take your science and take it the next step into translating is a really great thing for scientists. So I, I think first and foremost, it's worth um, having mentors and managers and others around you that see that see the world this way. If you see the world that way, then having other people who can help you understand what's um, you know, what, what's the right fit for you for your skills and interests. I also tell everyone uh, that I can about this concept of one way doors and two way doors, which is you. A lot of decisions in life seem like one way doors where you actually can't go back once you've made them. Things like uh, you know having a child and um, it, it, but there are actually very few that are one-way doors. Most things in life are two-way doors in that you you if you made the decision and then you realized it wasn't for you, you can go back. Um, and I think post-PhD and post-postdoc life is actually very much a two-way door. And I've seen other people on Twitter explaining it this way as well, which I think you should explore all the paths that you're interested in simultaneously. Um and don't feel like if you made the decision to go into academia or to go into industry that that has a you, you've gone left or gone right down the fork and you can never go back because today more than ever I think our our two worlds are very close and um, basically overlapping so um, you don't really have to choose finally at, at any point whether you're going into industry or going into academia you can hop uh, hop back and forth and work work in the cracks in between. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple more questions now in the chat. So um, someone says that you mentioned that making studies so that they benefit patients too is important. But another point of view that they frequently heard is even unconsciously motivating patients to participate in studies because the patients think that it might bring benefits to themselves, 
e.g. creating a false hope in themselves, benefiting from potential future treatment, is unethical. What would you say in response to that point of view? Yeah, I, I think it's a really valid point of view. And we we put all the studies that we run through an independent um, you know, research ethics committee or or IRB in the in the uh, if you're running in the US. And um, this is a frequent topic of discussion. The way the way that I always think about it is we like to design the programs that we run to have short, medium, and long-term value to participants. And the short-term value should be things that are really clear and incontrovertible. Like we're going to give you updates regularly about the progress of the study um, and, and we're going to keep you in the loop. Uh, you're going to get a free genetic test and you're going to get results and opportunities for counseling. There are some very incontrovertible um, pieces of value that you can bake in. And, and I very much agree with you. The hard part is the medium or long term to say, uh, you, you know, this may be this new investigative medicine may, um, you know, may help you and may treat your disease. Uh, we're always really careful in the the recs and IRBs, of course, are really focused on this, that that language has to be crystal clear that you're not saying this is a transformative medicine because the point of the, the trial is to test it. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's also comes back to designing the messaging with the participants and, and patients will, I think patients will tell you if they feel that the messaging is, isn't selling it enough or is overselling it. Um, so between, you know, the responsible trial design, the, the patient and participant advisory board, as well as the independent third parties, I feel like we can generally triangulate on what the, um, you know, what the right amount of uh, hope is because it, it is you know it is fundamentally there is a lot of hope in taking part in medical research but you're absolutely right we can go too far if uh, not careful great um so we've got another question here so apologies if you've already covered this but um when recruiting participants do you do this based exclusively on existing trials or can people with a family history of any genetic disorder sign up and wait for a study to become available yeah, but so both of those, um, we and and in fact, the vast majority of people don't match to a trial simply because trials are so specific and um, and aren't right for everyone. We're there's a whole thread of work that we're doing right now that I find really interesting, and I think it's going to be important in the next um, couple of years. Is this idea of pre-symptomatic genetic testing? So in uh, some of the neurodegenerative diseases I've talked about today, like ALS, uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, we the, there's two, uh, I think, pieces of data emerging. One is there are, the genes are incompletely penetrant, and there are a lot of carriers um, of, of the genetic variants of all those diseases that I mentioned. We've also seen that trial data seems to suggest that earlier treatment is actually more effective. Um, in ALS, for example, the there's a there's a hypothesis that treating either early in the patient's symptomology or pre-symptomatically may actually be more effective until waiting until it's progressed. Um, but this is a really challenging set of things to study in the real world because you've got to tackle a lot of the things we've discussed today. How do you um, responsibly notify people that they are a carrier and educate about things like penetrance? Um, and then also, how do you run these trials on a on a large scale responsibly to uh, try to intervene early in order to make an impact, but in a in a world where we know that the genes aren't fully penetrant? Um, so there's a whole layer of problems to solve there. But I think it's a it's an exciting one because if we can um, treat early and prevent diseases from progressing um, intuitively from first principles, it makes a lot of sense to me. Why wait until decades of damage has been done? And then you're going to try to unroll that with a small molecule or something if, if you could actually start earlier and um, prevent that that progressive process from taking hold. But it's uh, you know, it's hard to hard to overstate how challenging those kind of studies are going to be to run at scale. Thank you so much. It doesn't look like we've got any more questions in the chat. I'm going to ask you one final thing, I guess, before we wrap up. What next then? So what next for the company? Where do you want personalized medicine to go in the next 10 to 20 years? Like, what do you think the future holds? I, I think there's two broad things that are most interesting to me. The first is on the, on the rare disease side, we've got now incredible tools to make tremendous advances. And we're seeing diseases that were in, incurable five years ago now have transformative therapies. And I think 
we need over the next you know 10 20 years we have a big opportunity to cure many diseases that were previously incurable and, and there's 6,000 odd rare diseases that have no therapy whatsoever so the big challenges on that side are how expensive and time consuming it is to run these studies how expensive the drugs are once they are approved there's a, a lot of challenges there but I think we have the technology to um, really transform rare disease so I'm very excited about that and then the second major theme I guess is this early early detection and prevention theme especially for common complex diseases that have a strong genetic basis I think if we if we can uh, build a you know set of systems that allow us to do uh, reliable early detection and then we can start to flip the treatment paradigm from how do we treat the most progressed to how do we actually treat early and prevent or prevent through you know potentially non molecule methods i'm sure there are going to be amazing digital therapeutics and other um you know behavioral approaches we can take but how do we you know change the paradigm a little bit i with a with an ultra rare disease i think we're going to need things like crispr to go in and fix it but with some of the common complex diseases we may actually have um early detection may actually be the the real powerful tool on that side of the spectrum so the, that's the two areas that i'm most excited about and will definitely keep us occupied for a long time great well thank you so much today for speaking to us um yeah it was a fantastic talk and oh hold on hold on hold on we've got another question in the chat sorry um da -da 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 -da. You mentioned that for patients, a major barrier accessing clinics is transport. Paul Farmer mentioned the same obstacle in regards to treating TB in remote communities, which he described as donkey rental fee. How much crosstalk currently exists between the medical field, industry in sociology, anthropology and other fields that also analyse these community level issues? And what does the future look like for this? Yeah, I, I think not enough crosstalk is, is definitely the answer. We almost every study that we look at there's there when you start to peel back and speak to the communities and speak to people who are going to be involved there's a lot of really obvious ways that we can make the research better and easier to take part in um and and i do think systematically we don't engage early enough in research and and it's been a big topic the last couple of years but i think we could take it a lot further than we do today so i, I don't think there's nearly enough and i i from a technology perspective i i definitely think more and more things are going to be pushed to being remote and digital friendly there's going to be a lot of stuff that we can do from home which is going to make a lot of this easier but it won't be everything anytime soon we almost every study that we work on there's some kind of really specific instrument that is only in hospitals or you know there's some kind of invasive testing that in a clinical trial that almost always has to be done the number of clinical trials that can be fully decentralized is, is very few because of the uh, real constraints of, of what it is that you need to do. But I think I'm optimistic we can push a lot of the um, non-essential stuff into easier um, you know, at-home and online methodologies. But yeah, I, I also completely agree. We need to have more crosstalk with the, um, with the human side of the, of the work that we're doing because we tend to see that trial protocols are extremely scientifically rigorous. It's like the perfect experiment. Um, but then they've overlooked a lot of the real human elements of like how to, okay, the, you're going to have people visit once a week for 96 weeks. Like what if they don't want to do that? Uh, and they want to participate, but they, you know, they go on holiday sometimes so they can't, uh, they can't come every week for 96 weeks. And it's like, oh, we didn't really think of that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot, uh, I think a lot to be gained from some of that early discussion. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was really great um, hearing your talk. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate your time. Have a good rest of the day.